thank you very much, Matt, for that unique introduction. I like to think I've actually aged quite well in the six years I've been here, which is contrary to what a lot of people do. No, I shouldn't really say that. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I'm going to be talking, as the title suggests, it's an ambitious title, right? A decade in sports cardiology. I've, toned, I've honed it down for my 200 slides at the start, and it's a bit more appropriate now. But really, the realm is sports cardiology, and really honing it in on a topic that we are real, a world leader in, I feel like, at the moment and now. No conflicts of interest, learned objectives. Now, you may be thinking the title is a bit soppy, it's a bit wet. Home is where the heart is. While I'm no Pliny the Elder, I'm no Roman Emperor, or actually Roman Army Leader, or Philosopher, I'm going to try and deconstruct this title really in terms of what we see and why I'm talking today. And that's home is where the heart is because 80% of people in Qatar are foreign. However, many people consider this place home. However, we all realize that where we are from, our origin, our heritage, our ancestry, all play a part in who we are. And this is not just a physiological aspect or biological, but also environmental too. And I think as we sit here in the Aspitar Auditorium, here, this is not the Aspitar Auditorium, that is my office, but I didn't want to move for geographical precision. But anyway, as we sit here in the Aspitar Auditorium, our athletes that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are within these four walls. And oh, that didn't work. Here we go, this is a bit more exciting. But not only within Qatar, but we have to realize that we see athletes from all over the world. And indeed, it's shown no more fittingly than in this photo here. When to date, we have screened athletes from 151 different countries. And while it's a, a difficult topic sometimes to be talking about where people are from and how that impacts on our health, it's a topic we need to address because we see that there's not many institutions around the world that have such access to athletes from this diverse cohort. But how did we get here? Where did it all start? Well, it was these three wise men here. And while they didn't bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they may have brought knowledge, resources, and a vision. And a vision is often talked about here in Qatar. And it was at the start of this editorial that they even highlighted that Qatar, with its wide blue sky, searing desert sands, is not a location you may immediately associate with cutting edge sports cardiology. But over the years, this is kind of what has happened, I feel. And it, indeed, certainly at the time, it was the goal. In this editorial, they had a few questions and a few pointers of which they really wanted to investigate thoroughly. And where do you start? OK, Qatar, in the 1940s and 40s and 50s, and even in the 1980s, the Sheraton was a lonely figure in West Bay. There was not much infrastructure. We come to now, you know, 2018, and the infrastructure is well and truly in place. We have the resources and we have the people to actually try and implement world-leading sports cardiology. But what do you actually want to do? OK, you've got the infrastructure, you've got the people, but the goal was clear. It was to minimize cardiac events in athletes in Qatar and around the world. And once again, this vision was global. We weren't setting the bar low. I say we, Matt and colleagues, weren't setting the bar low they wanted to really make an impact here. And at the time, these were the two major cardiology bodies endorsing what we were going to do because the, um, the conditions associated with sudden cardiac death are most often silent. I was saying, okay, we've got the vision, but how do we actually implement it? What do we do? Which services do we include? What's best practice? And what do you actually focus on, whether it's screening or prevention? I initially want to start with secondary prevention because I feel like if you're going to do anything, you do this and you do it well. Because we know that in athletes, there's a, for every one minute of no CPR or defibrillation, your chance of survival decreases by 10%. And in a study from America, they highlighted that among high school and collegiate athletes, the average rate of survival of on-field sudden cardiac arrest was 49%. If you include AED into the mix, it goes up to 89%. And so I think it's so important for team physicians and 
physiotherapists and the like, to really have this nailed down when you're on the field of play. Know where the AD is, and I know um, this has been covered before, but make sure it's make sure it's spot on. But we don't want the chance of 50% of our athletes who have a sudden cardiac arrest to die. Is there a way of recognising those predisposed to such an event? Well, of course there is. And this is what we do here, and it is cardiovascular screening. And we see that throughout the world, there are most sporting organisations and federations now endorse cardiac screening. And I don't want to go into the debate, because it's even boring me about America and Europe, However, the American Heart Association still do not advocate the use of an ECG in their screening. And why is this a, a silly thing not to do? Use of word, maybe wrong there. But anyway, um, it's because of this. The sensitivity of detecting the pathology that can lead to sudden cardiac death has been covered. When using history and physical exam alone, this is the rate of detection. And it's woeful. In Matt's study in 2008, detecting none of the athletes that had a condition that would predispose them to sudden cardiac death, potentially. When we include ECG into the mix, the situation changes quite significantly. In Matt's study, it goes from 0% to 100%. In the worst case scenario, in Aaron Bagish's study from America, you double the rate of detection. And so I think. It highlights the importance of what we are doing here in Aspatar, but we do need to realise that there are um, a few things we need to consider when implementing ECG screening. Athlete risk, we know that sudden cardiac death is more common in athletes, and that is likely due to the androgenic surges and things encountered when playing sport. But we've also got to uh, consider the assessment of benefit to harm, and this is quite a big one, and it's looking at the false positive rate and whether we have the resources for further cardiological evaluation. A third one is requirements. Now, FIFA mandate cardiac screening in their athletes. And it's an important thing to consider when we look at resources, which I think is the most important one, when we take into consideration such study as this. And it was looking at the Rio Olympics, and these authors gave a questionnaire <coughs> to the team physicians and the chief medical officers of each nation. And we see here there is a big area of grey, and that is within Africa. And within this study, they highlighted two key points which could predict or were most reliably in identifying those countries that would screen more athletes. And it was the size of a country and the GDP. And so we really, are FIFA correct, for example, in mandating cardiac screening when potentially it is a case of funding, not necessarily whether they want to do it. Similarly, we did a study looking at the results of 10,000, I don't know if I can hear me, anyway, uh, 10,000 uh, people who performed an online test, an online course, should I say, on athlete's heart and ECG interpretation in athletes. And once again, we see here that while the numbers aren't that big here, the improvement and the performance of those people taking it in Africa uh, were the worst. And I don't want to focus on Africa, but I want to highlight the fact that ECG screening should be done if you can do it well, if you can afford it, and if you have the further cardiological evaluation accessible. Because if you don't, you are placing too many athletes at a risk of disqualification and or <laughs> undergoing further evaluation that is unnecessary. However, the main question tackled in this editorial from 2011 was that do the same rules apply to athletes of Arabic origin as they do of Caucasian athletes? So really, this sports cardiology athlete screening department were set up really to tackle this question because to date all data had been done in white Caucasian athletes within Europe. However, when you are faced with an ECG of an athlete and we know that ethnicity and race has an impact, what do you do? And it's important because the 
continuing increase in the number of athletes we see from Africa that are potentially African, Afro, African, Caribbean, African American is increasing. You see here the 5,000, 10,000 meters is dominated by the East Africans. And similarly, when we look at the top 500 ever times in the 100 meters, they are all of athletes from Africa, African American or Caribbean origin, bar two. And so really they are having a dominating impact on elite sport. And so, okay, there's an increased number of these athletes, but so what? Well, to date, most of the studies had been once again done in Europe and America on the Caucasian athletes. However, when we start considering the risk of sudden cardiac death in a black athlete, we see the sudden cardiac death incidence increase. In this study, the rate of sudden cardiac death in black male collegiate athletes was 1 in 21,000, compared to just 1 in 51,000 among the overall population there. When we go further, we see that male college basketball has an effect. But then we look at this. The black male college basketball athlete has an increased risk of sudden cardiac death, with this over four-year career having an incidence of 1 in 1,000. Now, if you put it into context, that is uh, twice as likely as it is for Tiger Woods to hit a hole in one on a par three on a course. And it, it really is quite astonishing, the variability in the rate of sudden cardiac death. And so this was identified even in the early 2000s that the conditions associated with this may be more common in the black population. And indeed they were. And they do also relate, translate over to the athlete. Now this study highlights the importance of what we're going to talk about now and it is because of the athletes that died, four out of five Afro-Caribbean athletes had a condition called idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy, which means that there was no final uh, firm diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, meaning there's no myocyte disarray. However, these athletes were dying. And the reason it's important is because of a physiological, pathological crossover that we see, because we know that athletes' hearts remodel. And when we know that it happens in pathology too, we need to be looking into this more carefully. And we need to try and hone our ability to identify what is normal and what is abnormal. Now, one of the key factors looking into this is the T wave, particularly on the ECG. And so many of you here may be thinking, oh my God, this guy's going to start talking about T-wave inversions again in T-waves. It's so boring. But <laughs> I need to, first of all, qualify really what a T-wave is. And in a section, I'd like to call riding the T-wave. <laughs> and because I love a T-wave and I can't deny it. So I thought I needed to create a little section to really explain what a T-wave is. And when we look at the ECG, some of you may be be just seeing squiggles here, lines up and down, and very bizarre little complexes. So what is a T wave? Well, these are the T waves. And what, the, what these represent is ventricular repolarization. So that's effectively the heart recharging, resetting, ready for a new contraction. And due to the way it conducts itself in this repolarization, the width of it is significantly larger than what we see in the QRS, which represents ventricular depolarization. And so there's a lot of information we can get from this T wave. When we're looking at it in clinic, we also need to identify and understand what is happening where on the ECG. And you can see here that the, these leads here, actually I'll do this, here, are known as the inferior leads. And these represent the gray area green area, sorry, here. And the anterior and septal leads are highlighted within the red, the lateral leads highlighted by the blue area of the ECG. And like I said, this can tell us a lot about the physiology and pathology of the heart. So now we know what a T wave is, well, what is a T wave inversion? Well, you see on, on the left here, the upright T wave, 
on the on the this one is negative. And we denote a T wave inversion when it's just one millimeter below the isoelectric line. So effectively that. These here you can consider deep. But what do these mean? Well actually in some populations they are normal. So we know in the pediatric athlete we can consider the anterior T wave inversion a normal finding. And this is simply due to the fact that in the womb your mother is doing all the work. She's delivering the oxygen and nutrients to you so your right ventricle doesn't need to, well actually your right ventricle actually accounts for 60% of the cardiac output because it just transverses to the left side of the heart. By the age of 16, these T wave inversions in the anterior leads should have disappeared. We also see anterior T wave inversions in the elite endurance athlete. And once again, it is responsible, uh, it is the reason why is because of its increased amount of training and the right ventricular dominance that occurs during such elite long distance endurance training. And this kind of causes the apex of the heart to kind of shift from this position to this position. And when we consider, we put the ECG leads in the same place for everybody all the time. And so when the heart is in a different position, it's actually representing a different area of the heart. And this can manifest itself on an ECG as a T wave inversion. However, to date, this is still considered an abnormal finding. The other population that we sometimes see an anterior T wave inversion is the female athlete. And this is twice as common as it is in the male. We still consider it an abnormal finding. However, this simply may, due, may be due to breast tissue. Kind of getting in this way once again of where we place the leads, kind of affecting what we see on the ECG. When we look at this ECG, we once again see T wave inversions. At this point in time, we considered this T wave inversions abnormal within the black athlete. However, research quickly came along from the UK group and showed this. Is it likely that 23% of black athletes are harboring sinister pathology? It's not likely. The most common area that we see this, however, is this anterior lead. And so what does it mean? Well, this study very nicely included a control group of age-matched people from the uh, general population. And they notified that also T wave inversions are significantly more common than they found in white athletes, suggesting that it is simply a racial variant. This study was lovely. They included another group, which were hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. They identified something very different, that those with pathology had, these, had a significant prevalence of lateral T wave inversion. Indeed, more than three quarters had this, and they were predominantly deep. And so when we look at this anterior T wave inversion in the black athlete, what does this mean? When we see that the prevalence of the anterior T wave inversion in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients and the black controls is the same, it's suggesting that this indeed may be due to training, like a, an exaggerated training response that we see among black athletes. Why? Not really sure. When we're looking at pathology, however, we must also consider there are often other ECG abnormalities we find. And the two particular ones that stand out as being very good identifiers between physiology and pathology are pathological Q waves and ST segment depression, which is found within up to 50% of those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What this looks like can be seen here. Within the yellow circles, we actually see what may be still athletic remodeling. However, the red circles denote deep asymmetrical T wave inversion in the inferior lateral leads. And this was indeed an athlete with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy.
So this can cloud our judgment of what is physiological and what is pathological. The other way that we see this conundrum is with regards to the structure of the heart. And just like any other muscle, like you guys that love a hamstring, you put them on the node board, they do a few little things. As you can see, my sports medicine knowledge is not great. I don't have any hamstrings, but anyway. Um, we see remodeling due to the exercise that we do. And we see it particularly within the wall thickness, so the posterior wall thickness that we see here, and the interventricular septum that is here. We also see this within those that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, with an exaggerated wall thickness, but also a smaller left ventricular internal diameter, which is here. And this can be quite a nice differentiator between the physiology and pathology. But a study, once again, this hadn't really been looked at in the black athlete. We know that they have T-wave inversions, which may be an exaggerated training response, but how about the heart? What well, we see, again, a significantly increased prevalence of this left ventricular hypertrophy, significantly more than we see in the Caucasian athlete. But why? Initially, when I looked at this study, I thought, ah, this could be a very good reason. In the white athletes, the average age was 17, and it compares significantly to that that was in the black athlete. Could this just be it? The fact that most of these white athletes that were seen in this study were younger. However, they very nicely followed it up with another study, which controlled for age and the body size. And yet, they still found 18% of their athletes with hyper, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Once again, very, very different to the 4% that they've shown in the white athletes. Importantly, they also found 3% that had a wall thickness over 15 millimeters. And this coincides with what is a criteria for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if you join this together with the increased prevalence of T-wave inversion, at this point, it's suggesting that 5% of these athletes that have a crossover between T-wave inversion and profound left ventricular wall thickness may be adversely, inad inadvertently, wrongly diagnosed with pathology. The upper limits of what we considered normal to this point were 30 millimeters. However, this study was in Italy and once again predominantly among the Caucasian athlete. So the study suggested that they raise the upper limit of normality to 15 millimeters. However, most of the studies to date have been among these uh, countries and regions, Europe, America, and a little smuttering of Australia down there, the Western world. But we've got to realize that this isn't the world. This is. So what do we do about our Asian athlete, our South American athlete, or indeed our Middle Eastern and North African athlete. Well, this population has been growing in certainly success. And there is, I, I've only included 15 pictures here, but there are 16 medals at the Rio Olympics for Arabic athletes. And so really, we know that there are differences in the way we interpret the ECG depending on race. But what about our athletes that we see here, here in clinic? What do we do, once again, when we are faced with an ECG that may not particularly look completely normal? We wanted to investigate this. And we followed on from an initial MAT study to include not only ECG, but we included echocardiography. We had Osman Salah who came in and did a 1,000 echoes in just two years. And he was the most laid back cardiologist I've known, but he was very, very efficient. And so he got us the chance to publish this paper looking at the Arabic athlete heart. But first of all, do we even see athletic remodeling in the Arabic athlete? Well, we do. We see that they have increased left ventricular internal diameters and increased left ventricular wall thicknesses. Indeed, they have twice as many athletes having a wall thickness over 10 millimeters than we see in controls. 
Now, the control group we had here were athletes that, we, that were presenting for athlete screening. However, they were exercising less than two hours per week. That was self-reported. And yes, we had chess players. And so it was a very nice way to be able to see, is there athletic remodeling in this group? We see this, that here, while the Arabic athlete has training remodeling of their heart, it is statistically smaller that this remodeling is than the black and white athlete. And you see a lot more blue bars at the beginning representing the Arab athlete than we do of a black and Caucasian athlete. However, strikingly, what we were quite surprised at with this study is this. Only 0.5% of our athletes had a left ventricular wall thickness over 12 millimeters. Now, the study we, I showed before had a prevalence of 18%, and that was looking over 13 millimeters. So what is going on here? Well, I'm going to get to that later, and it's very exciting. But, <laughs> <laughs> however, we're going to move on to the ECG. And the title of the paper were, was that do the criteria that are currently in place that were predominantly uh, based around the Caucasian athlete, do these apply to our Arabic athletes here in Aspital? Well, oh, damn, I didn't include the, the figure legend there, but the prevalence of an abnormal finding is equally common among an Arab and Caucasian athlete. Once again, we include the black athlete in the mix, and this goes up to 20%. And so, what is responsible for this? I think you can all answer this, but of course, it is the T wave. Oh, yes. <laughs> the, uh, the prevalence of a T wave inversion in the Arab and Caucasian athletes was pretty low, only around 1% or 2%. Dun, dun, dun. We include the black athlete, and it shoots up to 13%. Once again, it is highly unlikely that all of these athletes are harboring pathology. And so we kind of come to the same conclusion that this may be due to athletic remodeling. The only other finding we saw really of any significance on the ECG was atrial enlargement, which was two or three times as common in the black athlete than it was in the Arab and white athlete. This, however, has shown a very poor prognostic indicator of pathology. So, to summarize that paper, we know we can kind of assert that the criteria used at this point, which were European Society of Cardiology guidelines, can be used for both Caucasian and Arab athletes. And I don't think there's any need for any differentiation between these two groups. Black athletes, however, continue to demonstrate this highly prevalent abnormal ECG. Once again, Improbable 12% of black athletes have cardiac pathology. And so, what happens with this information? Well, it is the evolution of how we actually interpret the ECG. And in 2012, the anterior T wave inversion in the black athlete was accounted for and considered a normal finding. Subsequently, in 2014, there was another rendition of the inter international another rendition of these ECG interpretation guidelines. So what we wanted to do was see how is this affecting us in practice in Aspitar today? Are we having a similar rate of false positive rates? How many are undergoing further evaluation that is unnecessary? Well, we can see here, we actually stated in that previous study that the criteria were fine for our Arabic and Caucasian athletes. However, you see this prevalence of an abnormal ECG is incredibly high. Following on from the further 2012 criteria, this prevalence of an abnormal ECG, or actually false positive rate, so those undergoing further evaluation without actually having pathology, decreased by 46%. Finally, this rate was down to just 5.3 when we accounted for the latest refined criteria, as they called it, at this point. However, 
did we detect all of those actually with pathology, which is why we are here, this is what we are doing? Well, we did. Actually, in all criteria, every single case of pathology was identified. The specificity was increasing up to 94%, and we consider this within the realms of acceptability. So even though we know that there are going to be athletes that undergo further evaluation that don't have pathology, it's important because we ultimately are still identifying 100% of the athletes that do. Once again, we come to the differentiation between the Arab athletes, the Caucasian athletes, and the black athletes. And we again see that between the Arab and Caucasian athletes, the prevalence of a false positive rate is very, very similar. However, with the black athlete, it's 10%. And again, once again, we ask the question, is this acceptable? Well, the refined criteria kind of morphed into the international criteria that were published uh, a year ago, I think, or two years ago, I can't really remember. What they did was incorporate this yellow box. So before it was just you had a normal ECG or you had an abnormal ECG. And now we were considering the fact that if you had two or more of these findings, you'd be considered abnormal. Only one, you'd be considered normal. However, the one thing we noticed within this new international guidelines was that we still consider the black athlete having these anterior T-wave inversions as normal. But the ultimate aim of our study, we highlighted that it is unclear whether a blanket approach to this ethnic group is appropriate. We see there is a substantial regional difference in terms of cardio uh, cardiovascular disease prevalence. When we're looking at hypertension, West African individuals have a higher prevalence of hypertension than East African, athlete, uh, East African population. When we're looking at the anthropometric constitution and skeletal muscle physiology, we see clear differences between the East African endurance runner and the West African 100 meter sprinter or a football player. And one thing we often forget is this, just how big Africa is. It can fit China, United States, India, and most of Europe within its confines. And so it's important that we don't group these athletes as one. There have been studies looking at the African athlete heart. But what do we really mean by an African athlete? Because we can see quite clearly that there may be significant variation. And indeed, it was what we investigated. It was the impact of geographical origin upon the ECG and echocardiogram. And we see here in the pretty colours just how many countries we were able to uh, have an athlete from. Like I showed at the start, 151 different countries we have athletes from. And it put us in a unique position because there really isn't an organisation out there who could do such a study, who could take a world view of the athlete's heart. Within our study, we had 94% of athletes from these four sports, 50% of football players, 18% basketball players, 18 handball, and 12% were volleyball players. Now, you may be thinking, yeah, but you just showed me a picture of the East African middle distance endurance athlete and the West African football player or whatever. Are you really accounting for that? Well, there's actually one of the reviewer comments who kind of suggested this. And I, th I feel like it's a real strength of our study in that we have so many East African athletes that were football players and of a similar sport that we can kind of remove the effect of type of sport that has. We can also remove the effect of training load because, oh, I had a bit of fun there. Um, because we see the average hour spent training in our athletes was 12.4%. And that does kind of like go into actually what a study showed oh, what am I saying actually there was a study from the UK that showed that to be considered an elite athlete you had to be training over six hours per week at a regional national or international level 
and I'm not really sure what a regional or national level athlete here is in Qatar, but it suggests that we really do have quite elite athletes. When we moved to ECG, the main finding was this. There are significant differences in the prevalence of abnormal ECGs and these borderline findings, which are now considered an abnormal ECG, within the different region. When we take a look at it, once again, with the T-wave inversion, because it accounted for over 90%, actually 99%, I think, of our abnormal findings within this study were T-wave inversions. But immediately, you notice, within the East African athlete, the prevalence of a T-wave inversion was significantly lower than what I've been reporting all morning. It's kind of almost similar to what we see in the North African athlete, where it was just 0.7%. It contrasts directly to what we see in the West African and Middle African athlete, where the prevalence of an abnormal ECG and in particular T-wave inversion is back up to this 13-14% of anterior T-wave inversion. Now what does this mean? Well, of course the international criteria grouped these black athletes together and said that they, if they have an anterior T-wave inversion, consider it normal. But when we look at the different regions, we see, again, that those from East Africa have a very, very low prevalence of these, what we call in this study, benign T-wave inversions. And when such a low prevalence of these findings are occurring, can we really confidently say that these are normal? Especially when you compare it to the 5% in 11 or 12% that we see in the West African athlete. And I think it's important to highlight that most of the previous studies have looked at the West African athlete, and not many organizations and research papers have looked into the East African athlete. And this really may be quite significant when we're looking at an ECG and if we can consider it normal or abnormal. When we move to the abnormal T-wave inversion, we see that there was not one athlete from South Europe that had an abnormal T-wave inversion. And once again, the prevalence of a distinctly abnormal ECG or T-wave inversion was very similar among the North African, East African, and even South American athletes, in direct contrast to what we see in the West and middle African athletes, where once again we see it between 6 and 8%. Now what does this mean? It means that these athletes that were considered healthy actually are all undergoing further evaluation. So between 6.5 and 8.5% of these athletes have to undergo a whole workup of investigations which include an echocardiogram, an MRI, an exercise stress test and a 24 hour halter. And you may think, oh my God, you need to kind of modify the ECG interpretation criteria again. However, we found that in the athletes we identified with pathology, we found seven with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Among the black athletes, all of them had an abnormal T-wave inversion. All of them had a lateral T-wave inversion. And they were indeed deep. We had one athlete from North Africa that had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And he had T-wave inversions only in the inferior leads. However, he had ST depression and pathological Q waves, which are two other significant markers of an abnormal ECG. Incidentally, we also identified 12 athletes with an isolated inferior T-wave inversion that even after five or six years of follow-up have had no sign of pathology. So while we consider this, uh, this finding here abnormal, we're not sure whether it is truly abnormal. There was a study in the UK that showed that those with an isolated inferior T rhythm version once again had a specificity for a sensitivity for pathology of 0%. This may ultimately lead to a reclassification of how we look into this 
but there needs to be more research. When we're looking at these other abnormal ECG findings, they really are a good sign of the crossover between physiology and pathology because they were incredibly rare among our black athletic healthy cohort. Now that's the T-wave inver T inversion ECG stuff, but we also need to consider the fact that in this physiology pathology gray zone and question we are asking ourselves in sports cardiology, what about the structure of the heart? Well, we see here that the prevalence of left ventricular hypertrophy among, once again, the North African and East African athletes was 0%. In the West Asian athletes, it was just 0.8%. Again, similar theme, in direct contrast to what we see in the West African and Middle African athletes, where it's just where the prevalence of a left ventricular hypertrophy is between 4.5 and 5.5%. When we look back and think about our previous study, we highlighted a prevalence of this left ventricular hypertrophy of 0.5%. This may simply be due to the fact that we have a lot more East African, North African, and West Asian athletes in our cohort. And that was kind of skewing what we see in overall, in average. When we compare it to the South European athletes, we see just 2% have this left ventricular hypertrophy. In comparison, however, when we look at the African-American, the prevalence of left ventricular hypertrophy shoots up to 9.4%. And that is, once again, significantly different to what we see or what we saw in that initial study of just 0.5%. <coughs> Why is that the case? Well, most of our African-American athletes that we see are basketball players. And they are usually huge. They're usually well over two meters and well over 100 kilograms. And so this simply may be due to the fact that they are big guys with big hearts. However, when we looked at the scale data, so when we accounted for body size in our, I haven't included it here for time. I'm actually doing all right, that's not too bad. But I haven't included it. However, when we looked into the effect of normalizing for body surface area. This prevalence of left ventricular hypertrophy, or actually the rate of an increased wall thickness reduced back down, and the significance within this group was gone. However, we still saw an increased wall thickness among the middle African and West African athletes, once again suggesting that they have an exaggerated response to training. And why is this important? Well, when we look into the T-wave inversion and combine it with our understanding of left ventricular geometry and this wall thickening, we see something very interesting. And it is the fact that these athletes with an abnormal T-wave inversion are more likely to have concentric remodeling or hypertrophy in direct comparison to what we see in those that only had <coughs> what we consider a benign T-wave inversion. And again, it could be that the black athletes from West Africa and Middle Africa are demonstrating such an exaggerated response to athletic training that is potentially, this is very uh, speculative, but causing the T-wave inversions. In a rat model, it has been shown something similar. But again, why is this important? Well, it's important here because at the start of the presentation, I showed that this condition of possible hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or what is otherwise known as left uh, idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy, is more common in black athletes. And it may be that, we, that this may be uh, well, again, very speculative, but the athletes that we see within this group are those athletes that are within here. And a significant amount of research needs to be done to really investigate this topic because we can't really make any assertions uh, based on our findings here. But ideally, we group together with various institutions around the world to kind of answer these questions.
And so ultimately, we know that geographical origin does play a significant role in the prevalence of an ECG cardiac structural changes in the otherwise healthy black athlete. Should we be considering this when interpreting the athlete's ECG? At the minute, once again, more research needs to be done. But we do, and I feel like this is something that has been neglected within the research so far, is properly account for body size when assessing this wide heterogeneous sample of athletes that we have, such as here in Aspetal. Can we consider the upper limits of normality that were from that UK study of 50 millimetres? Are they actually appropriate for all athletes that we see here? Potentially not. But again, more research needs to be done. And again, there is a strong link between the abnormal T-wave inversion and concentric remodelling. Like I said, what does this mean? More questions need to be answered. Is this the best you can do in 10 years? I've rambled on a bit there. I've mentioned a few studies. However, I feel like we've got some important work to do. And that is based on what we have done to date. Within 10 years, we have done 15,000, I say we, the athlete screening department has done 15,500 screenings. All of them with an ECG, all of them with this history, blood pressure measurements, a full blood workup, and 7,000 with an echocardiogram. And where we really feel we can answer the next questions is with this data. We see that we have had 7,000 individual athletes present in athlete screening. 6,000 of these have been screened over five times. And this really isn't common. Most institutions and most research projects that are looking at athlete heart and ECG data do it as a one-off assessment. So we really are at a unique position here where we can investigate the longitudinal, long-term effect of repeat screening. Do we really need to be screening this many times every year? And how often do we need to be doing the echocardiogram as well? And I think this is an interesting uh, path for the future, but also to be linking this data with the sudden cardiac death data that we may have in Qatar to really, once again, identify whether cardiac screening is doing what we set out to do. And this really, I just want to finish on the fact that our athlete screening department is getting worldwide recognition from a reputable doctor here in Stanford, highlighting the fact that our work is world leading and contributing to what we uh, all came together to do in the international criteria for ECG interpretation. <coughs> now, the summary is of course just repeating all this, that Arabic athletes do demonstrate athletic remodeling not as great as that we see in Caucasian and black athletes and show a similar prevalence of an ECG abnormal finding to that of Caucasian athletes suggesting that we really don't need to differentiate between race in this regard. However, black athletes do present with significantly more abnormal findings. However, I feel like we need to consider geographical origin as a key factor in this. I think more research going forward needs to address this. Ultimately, thank you to the three, three wise men that had the vision, had the dream to instigate athlete screening and cardiac research. But also thank you to the whole team, and importantly, the cardiac athlete screening nurses that did 15,500 screenings over the 10-year period, which is just astonishing, really, and it's, it's not been done anywhere else. So thank you very much. <laughs>